We are just starting our, our first panel discussion. And I would like to, this one is um, Framing Justice and Equity in Historic Preservation. And I would like to introduce uh, the session's moderator, Rhonda Sinkavich. She is a PhD student here at University of Maryland. And she's also, you may know her from the National Trust of Historic Preservation. You've probably seen her at Pass Forward. So I would like to hand this off to Rhonda. Thank you, Michelle, um, and welcome everyone. As Michelle mentioned, this is the session Framing Justice and Equity in Historic Preservation. And I'm Rhonda Sinkavage, and I have the wonderful honor of moderating this session. Um, I'd first like to begin with thanking Michelle and everyone at the University of Maryland for making this event on what is perhaps the most critical issue in the field of historic preservation a reality um, facing a number of challenges. Uh, as folks have mentioned, this was initially planned for last spring and perhaps uh, the postponement was a blessing in disguise, not only in that we're now able to engage so many more virtually than we would be able to in person in College Park, but also that perhaps the conversations that'll happen over the next few days are even more meaningful and relevant than they would have been even just uh, a year ago. So I'm confident that this first panel will really set the tone for the next two days. Um, you'll be hearing from four thought leaders in the field who will provide not only provocative questions about justice and equity and historic preservation, but also offer some ideas for action um, in both practice and education. Um, speaking first will be a, a dear fellow colleague of mine at the National Trust, uh, Anthea Hartig, uh, who is now the Elizabeth McMillan Director of the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, and also the first woman to hold this position since the museum opened in 1964. Uh, she is currently leading the museum and crafting a vibrant new strategic plan to make the museum, take the museum through the semi-quincentennial uh, of the United States in 2026 and beyond. And we'll also show that this museum is the most accessible, inclusive, relevant, and sustainable American history museum in the country. Her presentation, Working Together to Reconstitute the World, will locate approaches that bridge scholarship, theories, pedagogies with lived histories and community curation practices broadening the preservation frame to include the larger canvas of public history and heritage conservation. Anthea will reflect on how social justice practices and goals can be integrated into this collective and intersectional work. Following Anthea will be uh, Luis Hoyos, who is an architect and emeritus professor of architecture at the California State Polytechnic University in Pomona, where he teaches historic preservation and urban design. He serves on the board of the National Trust for Historic Preservation and is a former member of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. He's also a current member of the California State Historical Resources Commission and on the board of the directors of the Los Angeles Conservancy. His presentation, Teaching Diversity in Preservation, will focus on how profound demographic changes and heightened awareness of racial and cultural matters have modified and enriched the natural discourse on what happens uh, and what it means to be an American. He will connect this work to teaching of historic preservation for architecture and landscape architecture. Next will be uh, Daviana Pomakai McGregor, who is a professor and founding member of Department of Ethnic Studies at the University of Hawaii Manoa and also the director of the Department Center for Oral History. Her ongoing research endeavors focus on persistence of traditional Hawaiian cultural customs, beliefs, and practices in rural Hawaiian communities on the main Hawaiian islands. Her presentation today, Island Histories and Indigenous Legacies, will question if historic preservation is another form of appropriating the history and culture of Pacific Islanders, whose history will be represented and perpetuated through historic preservation, what the purpose is of engaging in the process of historic preservation, and if historic preservation results in a process of hearing, 
healing or in the perpetuation of injustices. And the final presentation will be Dr. Andrea Roberts, who is an assistant professor of urban planning at Texas A&M University and associate director of the Center for Housing and Urban Development and a 20 <clears throat> winning public engagement fellow. In 2014, she founded the Texas Freedom Colonies Project, a social justice initiative that bridges applied research and community-based preservation to make a disparate impacts on black communities visible and promote just policies. She is also currently writing a book about black historic preservation practices. Andrea's presentation, New Narratives for Just Preservation, Seeking Progressive Intersections Between Preservationists and Infrastructure Advocates, investigates how planners and preservationists must address the assumptions and counter narratives undergirding decision-making related to job creation, adaptation to climate change, dismantling systemic racism, and addressing infrastructure needs. She stresses that preservation needs to be more intentional about creating new counter narratives about the relationship between emerging national infrastructure campaigns and historic preservation. And we'll use the Texas Freedom Colonies Atlas as a case study to illustrate how opposing forces, preservationists and infrastructure development advocates can work together. Following the presentations, we'll have time for a brief Q&A and I encourage you to use the Q&A box um, located in the Zoom or the uh, Google document that was mentioned that is located on the event webpage to ask questions of the panelists. And now I'd like to turn the program over to Anthea. Thank you so much, Rhonda. Dr. Sinkavage, it's great to be with you. And congratulations, uh, Dr. Michelle Magalong and uh, Dr. Don Leinbaugh. Um, all of the University of Maryland community. And it's an honor to be here with you uh, and especially with my distinguished fellow panelists. I'm also honored to acknowledge the precedents and the ancestors and the descendants of the Piscataway and Palmonkey and the Kachank peoples as I join you from Washington DC in the Capitol Hill neighborhood in a little barracks row house from 1855 that was most likely constructed by enslaved persons. I also wanna give thanks to all those who've come before me and all those with whom I ride along on this life's journey um, on whose grace and generosity and goodness I thrive and to whom I'm indebted. I'd like to make a special note to our preservation elder statesman, Dr. Knox Mellon, uh, who passed away last week, week and a half ago, who for so many of us in California and in the West uh, was a mentor and inspiration. Uh, like so many of you, I think just acknowledging these intersecting, cascading crises, viral, racial, economic, uh, climactic, and political uh, is, uh, is worthy as we also acknowledge our micro and our macro losses and, and grief. Um, I'm honored, of course, to be here and to follow the Honorable uh, Chairman uh, 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 from Arizona. Um, uh, Raul's work has been such an inspiration to so many of us. And like his broad kind of lens of, of, of thinking of, of preservation as a prism, um, the face of kind of integrated natural and cultural or seamless natural and cultural resource stewardship is something I've long thought about. Um, today, I'd like to, in, our, in my brief time, I'd like to explore the interrelated lens of that prism uh, with public history and heritage conservation. Um, I'm about 31 or so years into my career um, and I, I realize a large part of it at its best has been to seek um, and to undergird bridges um, in dedicated allyship, connecting as often and as generously as possible practice, scholarship, theories, pedagogies with the lived histories and with ways in which uh, communities are empowered and, and gain agency uh, through curation and public history practices. And I'm increasingly affirmed that um, by weaving the past and the present, stitching in time, um, uh, in other words, that we can bring stories to life through stewardship and curation, um, and that our work together can be a very powerful form 
of education and social justice. Like all of you, I'm in a state of becoming. I'm in the state of becoming a historian. Um, and I also acknowledge that I had quite a head start um, as I was propped up and still am by the cushions of whiteness and the pillows of the bourgeoisie. Um, one of the key things I think we can address together here is often the lack of continuity and discourse. Uh, and I think we'll get to this in a number of different ways throughout these next couple of days together between academic scholarship and public interpretation, um, between commemoration and activism and advocacy. Um, and together, I think, to bring forth um, and to honor the, the very materiality and immateriality of the past, whether it be with historic collections, places, movable and immovable heritage. Now that um, I'm at the helm of your nation's history museum, uh, when I came on, uh, it sounds a little bit like what, what Don and UMD are doing, um, but when I came on in early 2019, my first day was the February 19th, the Day of Remembrance, um, uh, uh, with the Executive Order 9066 my, being my very first uh, public program. Um, the museum's strategic plan had lapsed the year before, so I challenged my remarkably dedicated staff to create a new one, and uh, Rhonda kindly shared our, our our very uh, uh, ambitious uh, vision um, about being the most accessible, inclusive, and relevant and sustainable public history institution. The other half of that is this, so that our audiences reflect the demographics of the nation in terms of race, class, class ethnicity, geography, and gender. It all focuses and rotates around the new sun of our mission empowering people to create a more just and compassionate future by exploring, preserving, and sharing the complexity of our past. We adopted core values of accountability, care, collaboration, and courage, and the plan opens with a humble understanding that we don't stand separate from the tumult of the contemporary world and that we are very affected by the goodness and the creativity of humanity as well as, of course, the forces of racism and xenophobia and climate change. And right after we adopted this new strategic plan, of course, a global pandemic. But it does call out for the museum, and I think so many of our places can be, whether institute or online, uh, to be a forum, to be a place of convening for people to try and, in a safe space, confront the complexity of our shared history in order to make sense of the world around them. The pandemic, of course, the multiple cascading crises and pandemics challenged our new direction, like it's challenged so many of us, as we thought of how best to collect when you actually can't have access to materials or, or the building, um, how to weave in a digital response, how to plan for a future that was unfolding before us. Importantly, it also embraced the principles of language justice and embraced the process, the long, hard process, probably impossible at full, uh, at full breadth, a uh, process of decolonizing the museum. That latter decolonization work has evolved into an emerging frame of restorative history, um, spearheaded by my colleagues, Sian Wold Michael and uh, Nancy Burka, and a team of us at the museum. We combine the work of restorative justice with the work of public history and we come up with a, an approach to our work that uses the power of reframing the past as a tool to address the harms of exclusion from our national story in ideally in multi-pronged and very transformative ways. And so we're at work, our, those amazing colleagues are at work on a theoretical and methodological um, merging of restorative justice so that restorative history can expose silence truths, redefine our notion of belonging, and change our institutions, the very institutions, to be civically responsible and move us on that path towards redress and healing. One of the touchstones of our work uh, in, this, in this collective set of spaces of thinking about history as a restorative practice um, remains James Baldwin, who of course wrote so many amazing things, but in that 1963 address to teachers wrote that American history is longer, larger, more various, and more beautiful than anything anyone has ever said about it. 
And so like many of us, I carry that challenge with me. And I think we all know in this collective world in which we're operating um, that this, to tell a complicated, layered, harsh, beautiful, wonderful set of stories, especially now in these pandemic times, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a remarkable variety of historic and cultural resources, tangible and intangible, um, that reflect this powerful multiple shared narrative. And I don't need to, to recite those for you. I think many uh, in this Zoom community and in this symposium understand that richness, uh, but we've inherited incredibly powerful uh, and very complicated, I would say, landscapes um, and layered landscapes um, and, and always thinking about the layeredness of that, of that past um, and the many, many ways in which the built uh, and imagined and sacred world um, must work together. I could go on, but the questions and challenges seem to be clearer and clearer to me um, to embrace the remarkable and lasting diversity um, of the nation and the nations within the nation, uh, to celebrate and to understand the worst of, of our human interactions, to make the best of our human capacities, to stand up to small and large injustices with understanding, compassion, and empathy and humility, and to unearth histories in which we can see all of ourselves reflected, fuller, richer histories with all participants understood and recognized, and to honor our ancestors in order to sit, sustain the planet for our descendants. All of this as you know, must be done in the frame of, looming, of the looming existential threat of a climate in crisis. And I'm honored with Rhonda and, and many others to participate in the Climate Heritage Network, a new voluntary mutual support network of arts and culture and heritage organizations around the world, committing to aiding uh, their communities in tackling climate change and achieving uh, the ambitions of the Paris Agreement. Um, it's all an effort and I, I invite you to help me in any, in any, I think all of us do, um, that all of our work needs to be, especially in environment, as has been mentioned, needs to be rooted uh, in the principles of environmental justice. If we've learned anything this past year, um, especially those of us of privilege, um, it's a, yet again another painful reminder of the disproportionate impacts on, especially on communities of color. Um, and of poorer communities around the world. So what can we do together? I'll leave you with this uh, as my time is up. But I think some days um, that the poet Adrian Rich um, gives us some clues and that's the title of my talk. And it's a brief poem that she wrote um, in, in uh, finding a common uh, language in the early, mid seventies. My heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who age after age perversely with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world, a passion to make and make again where such unmaking reigns. So our roles are at once conservative and curatorial in those core definitions. Um, to care for, to steward, to preserve, to save, to remember, uh, and to stitch forward. Um, I reflect on so many incredible projects um, and people and partnerships over my career, uh, including the very first Asian Pacific, American Asian Pacific Islander Historic Preservation Forum in San Francisco. Uh, 20, when was that? 2010. Um, or was it even before that? Um, anyway, um, but all of our collective work, um, and I'm, it's such enriching and important work, and I'm so grateful. And the richness of that past, of course, is a testament to the struggles of those who worked and fought uh, to create a better future and press the nation to live up to its stated ideals. When the National Museum of African American History and Culture opened, uh, my friend and now boss, Lonnie G. Bunch III, then um, uh, not a, a, in agreement when President Barack Obama said, it is an act of patriotism to understand where we have been. 
So thank you for including me. Um, please keep in good touch. And I look forward so much to hearing from the rest of my panelists. Wonderful. I think Luis, you are next for presenting. Thank you. Uh, yes. And um, well, it's so nice to see Anthea and uh, I miss you. Uh, that was a characteristically th uh, thoughtful presentation. You'll find my talk somewhat on the practical side, but that's, uh, that's what I do for a living. I'm um, uh, essentially an academic um, uh, in a, in a large-ish, diverse, very diverse university here in Southern California. So there are no big diversity challenges uh, in the home shop, so to speak. It's been a, a very good second career for me. I'm an architect and now going on 20 years I've been teaching. So um, I face other challenges uh, because our, you, you should know that architecture schools are, are uh, markedly nervous environments. Um, but I know the time is short. Uh, Rhonda, should I share my screen? Yes, if you're able to share your screen, screen go ahead and do so. Give me a minute. Can you all see this? I don't believe that you, yes, no, it's not being shared. Okay. Uh, sh shall we go to your copy of this talk? Yes, I think Karen, you have a copy of the presentation. If you could share your screen, that would be wonderful. I'm glad we had the belts and suspender approach to this. And I apologize too. We are dealing with some uh, internet issues here in the Northeast. So there may be some delay. Okay. So, all right. So l l let me just, let me just start. I, I can advance, right? Uh, no, just let me know when to advance to the next slide. Go to the next slide. All right. Uh, my context, my, my situation uh, in, in the faculty and, and, and the way I have to manage uh, how I teach is very, is very tightly constructed. Uh, Historic preservation at Cal Poly, which is an undergrad and graduate program, which has a concentration in preservation, but that has hit uh, uh, a lot of uh, obstacles. Uh, it, the challenges begin because the classes are, of course, electives. They're not required. And uh, so I have to lobby students, essentially, very actively, to enroll. Uh, they must compete in a very, you know, superheated environment, sorry. They have to compete in this environment where uh, now with computers and now with, uh, with the overemphasis on computer instruction, uh, everything that's not part of that really has taken a back seat. So, um, so it, it, it provides um, a host of enrollment issues and challenges. Uh, so once I capture them in, in my classes, uh, they're either, the classes are either a straightaway academic seminar where I teach them to, you know, we, we write papers. Um, they often write nominations. So I've confirmed that even undergrads can write nominations to the National Register. And we've actually submitted not nominations to the state. Um, if it's a studio, then uh, it's usually an adaptive reuse project. And they also get the academic content of, you know, what, what preservation is and, and how you handle, um, and how you handle the uh, whole environment and the practice. Uh, with, the, with the goal being, of course, I, I have to prepare them for practice out in the world in, 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 uh, in CRM firms 
or in or in or in uh, multidisciplinary firms uh, of, of all kinds. LA is, of course, an enormous an enormous uh, environment. Next slide, please. All right, the first three week, three weeks or, or thereabouts is what you, you'd imagine. I, I, I get through the basics of preservation, the history, the jurisdictional issues and whatnot. Um, I also make sure that they tr you know, trust me and that we, we gain a certain language and a certain comfort level with the language. So if they're not comfortable uh, discussing uh, you know, terrible historical facts like uh, massacres, uh, you know, rapes, lynchings, and, and th things of that nature. You know, we, we, t we, we want to make them okay with, with, with reviewing historical facts. Uh, also, what do you call people in their, in their, in their um, uh, gender identities and their racial or ethnic identities? So we get rid of that. We, we get done with that on the first, first couple of weeks. Of course, we review the standards and we issue research projects right away. Uh, next slide. Now, what kind of students do I get? Uh, they're like 70, 80% diverse. So this is, this is an, incredible, uh, an incredible fact. So, uh, you know, I already start on, on the winning side. However, many of the students that I, that I get are first generation college, college uh, attendees. Uh, their families have not gone to university. Uh, they're often, uh, you know, I would say displaced, but you know, they often have, have migrated up to, up to the United States or they come from other, obviously another, other countries, the Middle East, uh, everywhere, everywhere you want. And they, they will have very fractured memories of their own cultural origins. So very often I have to make up for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, the lack of, uh, of, uh, of exposure to, uh, you know, Latin American history, Latin American or Asian American uh, architecture. Uh, because th there's no place for it in the curriculum now with uh, realignment to semesters and stuff like that. Next slide. Ah, uh, things changed for me a great deal when I was invited to, uh, to the National uh, Historic Landmarks uh, Committee and when I participated in the, uh, in the uh, American Latino theme study. That opened up a great, a great world, uh, because now all of a sudden um, uh, history was interpreted in nice, organized chapters that I could assign to students. Um, it provided bibliographies, which were invaluable, and uh, and and it provided endless, you know, call them lesson plans, call them whatever you want, but it provided a good basis for me to be able to say, if you want to investigate uh, um, Latino journalism in Los Angeles, read this article, come back to me, write the paper. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I also have to teach them the basics. So uh, using uh, HABs and, and all those programs, of course, is very useful. We did the we did the 40 acres uh, HABs uh, documents under grant uh, uh, facilitator, I think by, by, by uh, Dr. Toothman. And, um, and overall, we've been very good at getting student work shown in museums. Uh, at the bottom two images, you see the, um, the Dodge House by Irving Gill, which was turned into a museum exhibit in, uh, in Palm Springs. Um, next slide. I have to balance uh, general purpose preservation and in specific diverse content preservation. I have to cover a lot of things because of course, Los Angeles is a very old city, but it's also a very new city. So on the left, you see a, a Pueblo where we've done projects. And on the right, you see the, 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 the Wexler steel houses 
we've done several nominations um, which have not progressed uh, on, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, historical resources in Palm Springs. The students eat them up. I mean, they, 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 they love modernism. It's my responsibility to provide both sides. I, I hope it keeps it interesting. Next, next slide, please. Uh, we did the multiple property uh, not, not nomination for the, uh, for the Laudner houses. That was a great success. Again, not diverse, but the students ate, ate, ate it up. I, I gained quite a few rave reviews here. Next, next uh, slide, please. Uh, perhaps the most useful thing that I've done uh, with the with the with the um, theme study has been the um, the search for potential NHL sites. This was done while I was still part of the NHL uh, committee. A, a bunch of us contributed ideas for possible diverse NHL um, uh, sites. Uh, <coughs> Next slide. And the students provided initial research on, on heretofore unknown sites. <laughs> Everything from, uh, from um, large, large tracts of land in, in border states to, uh, again, following, following suggestions by NHL committee members and by, and by Dr. Stephanie Tuthman, who was very interested in exploring, for instance, migratory sites across across the country, so we we came across uh, a lot of things like that. On top of you know regular historic districts in places like Las Vegas, a uh, 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 national cemetery in, in Puerto Rico, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and that has led all, all those things uh, led to more more class content. Uh, controversies locally as our city is its intent on, on demolishing historic schools. Um, a lot of this has served as, as, as welcome background material for advocacy actions. Next slide, please. So the students have been able to um, at least explore the idea of, of writing nominations. Some of them have written very good nominations. Uh, this one is for the Olympic Auditorium, the first, the biggest, and the best boxing stadium ever built. Next one. Uh, and uh, more, more, more Latino content, uh, in this case, Cuban Americans, um, Desi Lu's Studios, which still stands, it's intact. Next one. Next slide, please. I think that's it. Uh, well, uh, I think uh, to, to wrap it up, uh, my greatest satisfaction in, uh, in teaching preservation is, um, is essentially uh, being able to, uh, to get jobs for my students. They've been able to, uh, to get good, good paying jobs in good architecture or CRM firms. And I ran into, run into them later. They do very, dangerous things like get a PhD uh, or, or do things of that nature. And that uh, makes me very, very happy. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Luis. Um, I think that was wonderful. Uh, again, a, a practical example on how we can kind of um, not just only understand this problem, but address it. And um, I guess also in quick, the future of the movement in understanding and addressing this problem. Um, next we have Diana. Rhonda, parenthetically, Rhonda, and much to my uh, regret, I have to teach at 11. <laughs> well, we will miss you for the discussion portion, but really um, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm very sorry, but, but, but have a great time. Uh, well, I'll be checking in later. Wonderful. And uh, next we have Daviana, and I see that you are able to share your screen. So um, take it away. Thank you so much. Aloha uh, from Moloka'i, where I am uh, broadcasting from and teach my classes now that we're uh, on, all online. And in my background is the island of Ko'olawe, 
um, shown the, the Halimua, which was the men's um, eating and gathering place. And then also here in the shrine, a shrine that we have restored for our makahiki purposes. I would like to open with um, a chant that honors my ancestors and a place that um, is a heiau or a, a Hawaiian temple that is on land that my, um, my grandmother acquired and um, which is now being um, uh, cared for and stewarded by the community in Haula on Oahu. <clears throat> And I want to thank Dr. Sinkovich and Dr. Mangalong for inviting me, including me in this uh, discussion. Aloha mauna wila i ka malie, malie i ka malui loko pa mawaho, holopuna i ki ke ka i ka palawa, halia aloha makua kaumana, my ha'alulu i ka leo, e o ka ma'aina, e mau na limahana o keia aina e a oya. And again, this um, heiau that I viewed is Mauna Wila heiau. Um, and um, I've in, woven in my ancestors. Pamawaho is my dad and my grandfather. Um, and um, Speaking of it, this is a, an intermittent stream running through it, going down to this point, Kapalawa, which means the place of the sperm whale. And my other grand, great grandfather, Ha'alulu, Kalima Ha'alulu, is woven into the chat. And my, um, my grandmother's family, uh, my grandmother is Aoi, and her family is Limahana. And today, the, <clears throat> the land that the Heiau is on is being stewarded by the Hawaiian Islands Land Trust the Ko'olau Loa Hawaiian Civic Club, the Ha'ula Community Association, with funds provided by the State of Hawaii Legacy Lands Conservation Commission and the City and County of Honolulu Clean Water and Natural Lands Fund Commission. <clears throat> Reframing historic preservation in relation to Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders raises issues of the role that the American settler state plays as the entity that anoints a site as having a significant role in the national history of the United States. The American settler state disrupted the independent development of Hawaii and Pacific Island nations and suppresses the self-governance of indigenous Pacific Island peoples over whose island territories are, are not um, the United States now claim sovereignty. The, um, <clears throat> the American settler state also racializes Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, perpetuating institutional forms of environmental, economic, social, and cultural racism. So is historic preservation another form of appropriating the history and culture of Pacific Islanders as part of the national narrative of manifest destiny and benevolent assimilation and the dynamics of social Darwinism, whose history is represented and perpetuated through historic preservation? Is the purpose to attract visitors and tourists or to enhance the cultural life of the community? Um, and these are historic sites. Pohakuloa is on the top and it's in the saddle between uh, the, the mountains of Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea. There are several cultural sites and recently a Native Hawaiian had filed suit and our Hawaii State Supreme Court found that the state of Hawaii was not effectively uh, managing the military training to effectively protect the cultural and historic sites and that they needed to take measures to, to better protect the cultural sites at Pohakuloa. And the island of Koholabe um, shown below was used for 50 years as a military training ground until Native Hawaiians rescued it from that abuse. Um, but we, and we managed to have the whole island placed on the National Register of Historic Places, but the military could still um, conduct military training on the island nevertheless. <clears throat> what are elements that can be part of the process of historic preservation that will truly honor the heritage of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders? Acknowledge the aspirations for self-governance, cultural perpetuation, equity, social justice, and well-being, and not simply subsume these groups into serving as tiny, colorful pieces in the mosaic of America's national history. The process of honoring and protecting 
specific places in Hawaii as a historic site, property, landmark, or cultural landscape to be complete needs to involve a process of acknowledging the experience, history, and culture of each of the peoples who are connected with the honored place, beginning with the history and culture of the indigenous native Hawaiian people of the land who first experienced the land and its resources in its natural form. More importantly, the process and designations should serve to restore relationships of caring and nurturing the land and its natural elements. The land is immovable, however, its features can be transformed over time by the waves of people who live upon it, cultivate it, and develop it for various purposes until its original features are difficult to distinguish except through imagination. Nevertheless, the land remains the foundation of the cultural and social history of all peoples in our islands. The nomination process should trace the genealogy of land from present uh, and back through history to the elemental forces that defined its landscape. As an example, this is the island of Kanaloa Ko'olawe in Hawaii, which I mentioned had been used for 50 years as a military training center. Um, and it is a sacred place um, that was historically degraded by goat and then cattle ranching and finally live fire military training, including the bombing and shelling of the island. Dr. Pulani Kanaka Ole Kanaheli composed an Ole Ko'ihonua, a gene genealogy chant for the island that was presented at a healing ceremony for the island in August 1992. Each stanza of the chant conveys a period of the island's history from its birth as a sacred child of the earth mother Papa, as a place of fishers and farmers, through its destruction by ranching and the military use, and its role now as a site of resistance, and then a center for the revival of Native Hawaiian cultural and religious practices. Such a chant embodies in an abbreviated form, the process of distinguishing the layers of history for a particular historic site or landmark that I am suggesting is essential for the historic preservation and nomination process. Um, the document documentation of indigenous place names, as well as chants that have been composed for the place, the songs, the sayings, the stories of place are important in order to appropriately represent the history of place. This documentation should include contemporary historical and indigenous names. So for example, Pearl Harbor, its original name is Ke'avalau Apu Loa. And you can see um, here it is in this part of the island and it's col the color area shows that there are many multiple streams that feed into the harbor and um, just thereby creating many branches. So Ke'avalau Apu'uloa represents that there's several little harbor areas within Pearl Harbor, what is called Pearl Harbor, um, because of those uh, resources of fresh water pouring into the ocean. And here is a map showing the different locks, but which, which we call Ava, the, the multiple um, harbors uh, within Pu'uloa, where native Hawaiians had fish ponds, uh, very productive fish ponds, and it's a deep water harbor, so uniquely deep water fish ponds and shark shrines. There is also the oysters that grew there, which therefore the name Pearl Harbor, um, as well as shrines for the fish for fishing. And it's important to document um, the, these original uses. Um, but the you know, as our history evolves, sometimes the the contemporary history, the history or the more current history and the, the history related to um, its, its role in the history of the United States takes precedence. But it's important to acknowledge the original name given to lands the landscape, the particular site um, as, um, and um, acknowledge those original histories. And on the edge of Pearl Harbor is one of the efforts that the Navy is doing in co collaboration with the community. Um, this is a picture of the Pa'ai Ao fish pond, which has been full of pretty much sedimented, but there's a collective effort by the um, Navy with the community to restore the, the, that fish pond within the larger Pearl Harbor complex. Um, in addition, ethnographic research and archaeological investigation should extend over a range of history and not be limited to one culture group or period of history. 
In closing, um, I would like to quote the late professor and kupuna, Edward Kanaheli, um, who provided an eloquent explanation of cultural and sacred places we call Vahipana. And he provided this in the introduction to a book called Ancient Sites of Oahu, A Guide to Archaeological Places of Interest by Van James. And I want to just share excerpts from that essay to introduce an alternative concept um, that I would like to have embedded in historic preservation process to start the process by acknowledging the site, the place, and its significance and importance to the indigenous people. And um, Dr. Kanaheli said, wrote, in ancient times, the sacred places of Hawaii or Vahipana of Hawaii were treated with great reverence and respect. These are places believed to have mana or spiritual power. For native Hawaiians, a place tells us who we are and who is our extended family. A place gives us our history the history of our clan, the history of our ancestors. We are able to look at a place and tie in human events that affect us and our loved ones. A place gives us a feeling of stability and of belonging to our family, those living and those who have passed on. A place gives us a sense of well being and of acceptance of all who have experienced that place. A wahipana is therefore a place of spiritual power which links Hawaiians to our past and to our future. Our ancestors knew that the great gods created the land and generated life. The gods give the earth spiritual force and mana. Our ancestors knew that the earth's spiritual essence was focused at Vahipana. And here I'm showing these are um, cultural historic sites that are also being restored actively to feed our population. So these are fish ponds. This is the Heia fish pond in Kaneohe on Oahu. Um, this is a fish pond at Ualapu'e on Molokai. Both are being restored and now providing um, uh, food for the communities. And these are other restoration projects. Uh, this is showing the construction of the wall, reconstruction of the wall here at Heia fish pond. Um, and uh, also people working on that restoration project there. Uh, and uh, these, these are also other concepts of restoring other places of cultivation that are also historic cultural places. Uh, and in a study that I've done, it shows that our taro terracing irrigation complexes um, are what we call our cultural historic landscapes and have a longest record of our cultural uh, sites on the land. And there's a whole movement to return the water that has been diverted from our windward sides in Waiahole over to uh, grow sugar cane on the um, leeward sides. And returning of those waters then enable us to restore the uh, taro terraces and the irrigation networks that the stream waters supported. As we move forward together to honor the cultures, lifeways, and histories of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, let us also honor the associated natural landscapes essential to the events and not just as a backdrop to the drama of human events. Let us also consider approaching this process from the perspectives of Indigenous Pacific Islanders ourselves and consider new approaches and a criteria for such sites and landscapes. Um, Mahalo or thank you very much and aloha. Thank you so much, Daviana. Um, if you are able to make Andrea the host um, so she can share her screen, that would be wonderful. Um, if you go to participants, you'll probably see that you... Um, oh, somehow I got to be the host, <laughs> excuse me. Yes, <laughs> you would be the host so you were able to share your screen. So if um, you could... Um, um, I, um, let's see, I'm unable to find how to do that. I'm so sorry. Rhonda, oh, she should there, be a co-host right now. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. What I had done was enable panelists to share. Okay. Mahalo. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And our last uh, presentation for this session will be Andrea Roberts. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I'm assuming everyone can see my screen right now. Is that the case? Yes. Yes, it is. Wonderful. Yeah.
Uh, again, thank you so much, uh, Michelle, uh, for putting together this conference and making me a part of this illustrious uh, panel of experts. Uh, I want to first uh, acknowledge that I'm speaking to you in Bryan College Station on the land of the Tonkawa and Santa tribes. And of course, uh, to acknowledge all of the landscape processes uh, that have made uh, my uh, life and work uh, possible. And that includes that of uh, migrant workers as well as enslaved peoples here in Texas. So I'll be talking about new narratives for just preservation. Uh, understand that when I speak of narratives, I'm talking about how narratives reinforce or elucidate a given belief or truth. Uh, conversely, a counter narrative disputes commonly held assumptions about the nature of reality, place, positionality in the political moment. So counter narratives and narratives, they pervade scientific discovery, finance, education, media, all the areas of our lives because they frame the boundaries and the possibilities of debate and they gatekeep access. And so I'm speaking to today about pervasive narratives that I think um, can inhibit and complicate the pursuit of racial equity and progress in the context of historic preservation, urban planning and infrastructure development. And so there's some strong narratives at the intersection of race and, and preservation um, and uh, public life. And uh, we see them here today, and they were acknowledged earlier by uh, uh, the chair, the congressional member uh, that gave our opening remarks concerning the power of the narratives that uh, complicate public life and, and democracy. Uh, we see here two sets of narratives. One narrative espoused by uh, initiatives such as the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund and the 1619 Project, and the other by the now uh, uh, defunct 1776 Commission Report, and of course the Stop the Steal rally on January 6. Uh, what we see here are uh, really ongoing conflicts that endanger public life and democracy in America. One that espouses a persistent uh, narrative uh, that has been with us since that of the lost cause, and another that isn't just about a counter -nar narrative, but really is about showing the inextricable links between slavery and racial conflict in America's origins. And so we see that the backlash to espousing this counter, its progressive counter narrative has actually uh, been deadly. And if we look more specifically to planning and some of the dominant narratives in planning, and I'll talk about them in the context of African-American communities, we have certain tropes or ways that we speak about African-American communities in the planning profession. Some of their, them are rooted, these ideas, uh, in some assumptions about black places that they are, uh, have not the same aesthetics, not the same physical integrity and quality, that there are one size fits all solutions uh, to making them better places to live, that everyone lives in blocks and corridors, and that they're all inner cities. And that when we talk about historic African-American communities, we automatically think of them as a entity from the past and not relevant to the present. And so there's a certain assumption and a lot of these have, these ideas rather, have uh, complicated uh, the relationship between planning uh, professionals and black communities in very specific and tangible ways, such as when we look at the impact of highways on African communities and urban renewal and suburbanization, all in the name of progress, which have led to the destruction of African American communities. And when we speak of it in the context of historic preservation, which we're most uh, concerned with today, um, this diagram is showing sort of the spheres of influence of narratives. We have status narratives that tell us who we are as a nation and, and animate our public history, narratives that dominate our political discourse and also uh, our agendas and uh, how we allocate public resources, context statements, designations, markers. Those are the narratives uh, that we're most familiar with in the day to day. And then big picture, there are leadership and organizational, organizational cultures that have narratives that determine the insider and outsider status that we attribute to who belongs in the tent, who sets the table and decides who's invited 
who does the convening and who does the granting. So today, I, I mean to make some very simple direct points about narratives, not as um, antiquated or uh, sentimental ideas uh, about why things are the way are, or they are, but very significant aspects of um, our practice and our policies and our public life. Narratives over the past year have meant the difference between life and death. We've seen it. Narratives reveal or hide injustice and erase or illuminate inequity, and counter narratives from the margins reveal new publics, disparities, needs, and new policy ideas. And counter narratives, I argue, should be harnessed and translated to the policy space as data, which means we have to prioritize counter narrative integration into consultation and discourse. How? By leveraging technology and existing grassroots communication pathways, which I'll describe. The more specific context in which I do the work around engagement and consultation and, and equity are in communities known as Texas Freedom Colonies uh, that often confound dominant narratives about what is a place and what is historic. Uh, they're often described as places individually unified by a church and school and residents' collective belief. And there are few things that are more ephemeral than a collective belief. And those collective beliefs are often in story and memory. Founded roughly between 1865 and 1930, Texas Freedom Colonies are founded in areas that you might characterize as bottomland and coastal areas, uh, mostly rural by clusters of landowners. Notably, African Americans founded these as landowners in 1870. They had less than 2% of all farm land in Texas. By 1910, owned as much as 31%. That number is barely 1% at present. So we see that place narratives survive the dissipation of the features often of these places. And they also face challenges that I cluster in three main categories of access, visibility, and vulnerability. So we see examples of municipal underbounding in which places are not even recognized as places or part of budget processes or uh, the funding of infrastructure as in Sand Branch outside Dallas. If land dispossession in which the terms or the claims that people make to land are often wrapped up in oral history rather than in uh, legal claims to land that are recognized and disasters and hazards. And notably disasters and hazards, uh, most recently we can look at Hurricane Harvey in which uh, 43 of the county, 43 counties in Texas uh, contain 229 freedom colonies impacted by freedom uh, by uh, Hurricane Harvey. So Texas freedom colonies contend with some dominant narratives that can be simplified as this, that a real place has boundaries and population. And to know that people care about a place and there's a constituency, you have long-term residency and tenure. And with freedom colonies, you have non-residents and part-time residents who are diasporic and dispersed, yet attached and involved and connected to place through cultural practice and storytelling. And freedom colony places are often ephemeral, recalled, mem remembered, embodied, and have questionable um, or not easily to identify boundaries. And so uh, this all led to my starting in 2014 through my doctoral research of some means to address these issues of access and visibility and vulnerability, and that is the Texas Freedom Colonies Project. And there's three uh, primary functions of the project. That is to connect um, and collect place making, making and place keeping stories and histories, to counter map and secure data and varied resources associated with understanding these places and their challenges, and to co-create engaged applied research, leveraging the relationship with descendants and their data and their stories. And I did this in the, uh, in the context of Deep East Texas uh, in Jasper and Newton counties. And when we think of Jasper County, we don't think of freedom and free black space because the dominant narrative is that of the dragging death of James Byrd, a very real, and very concrete example of uh, the power of certain narratives to tell the story of a place. However, the story that we don't hear is that he was dragged in front of Huff Creek Memorial Chapel, which is an African-American settlement. So in the process of us learning of the death, we have a complete erasure 
of the story of African-American placemaking that was also desecrated um, in the process of uh, the, the violent uh, racial violence that occurred there. And so the work that I engaged in uh, used various forms, not always um, associated with urban planning, but performance ethnography, oral histories, various modes of experiencing place and capturing counter narratives from descendants where it revealed hidden diasporic, diasporic publics and places. And I learned a few things, that counter narratives reveal best practices, that the foundational stories of place foster an attachment which encourages participation and catalyzes real planning and preservation outcomes associated with even listing of historic places and stewardship of land and protection of cemeteries. And all of that information once uh, organized and geotagged, populated before and after maps. Uh, one on the left that is showing uh, only 14 settlements uh, known in public records versus the other map uh, collected uh, a result of collecting data and story of place, which shows some 35 settlements enlarging the footprint of African Americans and their shaping of the history in these counties. And so what we did uh, is develop the atlas. And the atlas is an accumulation of publicly associated public data that's available about place, along with uh, ephemeral and personal archival data and story, as you see below a funeral program, which is input into a survey form, which you can also add the location to, which populates a dot in a drop box, which tells you the story of place. And so I wanna offer, and I won't read the whole story to you, but I'm offering just one of the many entries that have been added by the general public. This is a public utility and resource uh, by Ms. Cynthia Matlock. And I'm highlighting here that she begins by saying that she doesn't know when the community started called Green Chapel. But all of the highlighted information here at first glance, you can see dates and names of families and places. And this gives you some insight into what's not on the map but what's in, in the memory of our elders and the stories and memories they have of place that, pop, that enable us to see uh, remaining cultural assets and, and resources that need protecting. And so the Atlas does a few things. It increases visibility of freedom colonies strategically. It spatializes intangible heritage and physical vulnerabilities and needs, increases descendants and researchers access to data and it aggregates, secures, and centralizes all these data forms. And it's grounded in local significance and sense of place. So what have we learned from doing this work of accumulating data and uh, based in story and surveys from uh, the public about these places? Well, 357 have been mapped and verified. That's what we begin with. This is our core number. And 10, uh, 10 of those have been converted um, into, or rather we have a li total list of 557, 357 of those mapped and verified. Since the beginning of this work, 10 of those that have not been verified have been verified. And we now have a total list of 664 place names. 45 of those 664 were in, introduced to the Atlas by users and were not in our original list, which means that the universe of public knowledge about African-American placemaking and historic resources has been expanded through the crowdsourcing of this data. And out of the uploaded data, we have 90 place narratives that did not exist. They did not pre-exist in our publicly available databases. And so these Atlas and methods have impact. Um, it's not just to say we have a map, here's some dots, and here's some stories, and let's remember it isn't that nice. Rather, stories make place visible in planning and preservation, practice and process. We've seen an increase in the number of historical marker applications that explicitly mention freedom colonies and reference the map, as well as National Register designations over the past two years. Archaeologists, including uh, the Texas chapter of the Council of Texas Archaeologists, adopted our atlas as one of the uh, websites they use in their desktop reviews before they even go out to the field. 
We've incentivized and shaped uh, people's crafting of ordinances. And we have also been a part of CLG survey and DEI trainings. And finally, um, these are recent developments. Uh, we've been included in uh, various approaches to getting rural districts uh, listed to the uh, state uh, district, getting listed as a state district in the National Register, one of which I've just heard about uh, this morning, frankly, in the state of Virginia. Uh, there's a freed people settlement. It's the first one in the state that's getting a rural district designation. And they ascribe some of their, or attribute some of their success in making the significance arguments to our ethnographic methodologies. And the, there are multi-hazard impacts that we're beginning to explicate through the use of mapping and crowdsourcing. Uh, and that is evident in a paper. Uh, it is a paper that has been published by one of my team members I'm very proud of, uh, Ms. Jennifer Blanks. And it is uh, about uh, re historic resources in Cancer Alley, where we're looking at the intersection of risk and freed black settlements and freed black cemeteries. So we're, we're doing work that's very much about the margins, right? These particular places that is having influence elsewhere. And when it comes to infrastructure, what we found in our engagement with descendants, as in this example, is that at the same time that we talk about the vulnerability resources and the difficulty with adding information, at the center of this discussion is the challenge of rural broadband access. So as we build back better, as we think about our past uh, relationship to infrastructure destroying our communities and the present in which we need and require some infrastructure improvement to continue to do our work and leverage technology to preserve resources, we need to have new conversations, new proactive conversations about both infrastructure need, risk, and cultural resource visibility in these discrete, complex communities. This means increasing the communication pathways to increase access to discourse and policymaking, to invest in both on and offline consultation and engagement and innovations. Um, and I would count this uh, atlas as uh, a potential. Uh, we're growing into a broader uh, website or web presence in which we hope to make it a hub for communication uh, around uh, being able to interact with public agencies so that the public can interact with them and let them know their feelings about places in which they may not be full-time full residents, and that we address the false dichotomies. We have to be proactive about inevitable class between the rush to build back better, which is needed, and preservation process. And the pervasive that narrative is that of red tape. And so rather than red tape, let's endeavor to think more proactively about how we elevate story, elevate voice, and also address need and mitigate risk. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you so much, Andrea. And we have about 10 minutes for question and answer. So I'll invite all the panelists to, to turn on your video. Um, first, I think we're gonna go to some of the questions that were submitted by the audience. Um, one is asking about disability advocates and how to ramp up efforts uh, to preserve and represent disability histories in historic preservation. And I know many of the panelists have worked with um, you know, other communities that have been either underrepresented or excluded in the preservation conversation. So what would you have to say uh, for advice to kind of engage this other community that has been traditionally, I guess, left out of the preservation conversation? You can think of ways that, um, I guess, when you were beginning to engage with preservation for your respective groups, if you have uh, ideas on how to kind of uh, work with the preservation community. And, and in some ways, this addresses, I guess, the larger question of um, how preservation should be uh, more inclusive of those other narratives that aren't traditionally included. Right. <clears throat> Just speaking from um, both a place-based perspective, but also a museum perspective, 
Um, and I think there's a great community of sharing that could result from all of this. And I just wanna give both um, uh, my dear friend, Luis and Drs. Roberts and McGregor, um, my deep thanks for your great presentations. Um, but I think there's a community of practice that we could definitely include um, we've talked, um, we've embraced from the start, we host the Smithsonian, the entire Smithsonian's disability, ability, accessibility um, team are in our building. So we work together almost constantly to try out different modes of, of access um, and different ways to make both content and place and learning accessible. And so I think those are very translatable because again, they take place both in, um, in educational spaces as well as in literal spaces. But I think what we're hearing throughout this panel is just kind of the humility and the sensitivity of inclusion and, and, and to also own what we don't understand, right? Especially as, as able-bodied people um, to, um, to, to, to make that outreach. Um, I also think we're, in, we're long overdue for a reckon, it is obviously the era of reckoning, um, but we're long overdue for an, a reckoning um, between um, Title 24, the ADA, um, the incredible, honoring the advocacy. One of the ways we can do that from the Smithsonian is to honor the advocacy that even got us to the ADA, right? The hardship the incredible hardship and sacrifice that people made to get us to that law. And then the subsequent, uh, in California, it's Title 24 and other states have their own. Um, but to bring that both into the narrative um, uh, and, and, and also um, to Dr. Um, Robert's points, um, there are a lot of counter narratives involved in accessibility history that, that we don't bring out, that we don't understand and we haven't woven yet into you know, the, 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 the larger fabric of what we consider even the past or worthy of preserving. So just, just some initial thoughts, but I, I think it's actually really, it's a really important conversation and it cuts across all of our allied disciplines that you saw on the panel today, Rhonda. Yeah. McCreed, any other thoughts on that question? I'll also note that um, in the Q&A, there was a, a resource that the Park Service um, has been beginning to think about disability history. Um, so if you wanna check out that link on the Q&A. Um, we have a question for uh, Professor Roberts. African-American burial grounds would seem to be among the few tangible evidences of freedom communities. Therefore, would you agree that protecting them becomes very important? Yes, I would agree. Um, to that end, what we've been attempting to do at Texas Freedom Colonies Project is, uh, and you actually saw it on one of our slides where we had a meeting with uh, descendants where we asked them to test drive our atlas and to tell us th uh, things that they wanted changes or what they wanted more of. They wanted individual layers, not just for settlements, but for cemeteries. And often cemeteries are what remain. Yeah. Cemeteries are often all that remain in some of these settlements, so they're absolutely vital. And one of the things that we're doing is we're completing a st strategic plan in partnership with Root Cause Research. Uh, we're developing a new atlas that will include a cemetery registry. And we're also working in partnership with Texas Historical Commission to examine the ways in which people ask for assistance to save cemeteries and what are the gaps. Where are people finding blockades? Where are they being rerouted? So that as we guide them to the registry, we can then guide them to need, uh, to, to ways to, to properly address need. Great, thank you. Great. Uh, we have another question. Uh, did anyone else wanna comment on that? There's a question that is, I think, directed to Daviana, but uh, I think others could probably chime in if you would like. Um, the question is, when you participate in American historic preservation gatherings, do you encounter sovereignty, av sovereignty advocates who you feel should not be in these locations because this tends to validate U.S. Uh, homogeneity? If so, how do you respond? So, yes, aloha, I see that was from Franklin Odo, and I can't turn on my video for some reason. It says the host um, won't allow me to. So sorry about that. <laughs> I can see my family Star Wars fans. Um, 
But I think that, uh, well, I think uh, for Native Hawaiians who are doing education to the public about sovereignty and, and our desires for independence, I think they still welcome various venues in um, in the U.S. And, and and internationally to to tell our story and to be represented. And I think if if we're not present in these um, places and the historic preservation landscape, then that you know that contributes further to the erasure of our history. And so I think um, for the most part. Uh, people welcome the opportunity to go and tell our story and, and broadcast it more generally. And um, I think the, uh, as, as in the case of Kohlabu, we've used the issue of historic preservation as one of the ways in which we can control the mismanagement and abuse of our uh, cultural sites. Uh, mm -hmm. As in the case which I shared about Pohakuloa most recently, someone who's very at adamant, you know, independence advocate did use the court system to try to control the military training that is destroying cultural sites at Pohakuloa. So it's all a matter of, I think, those who, of us who are intelligent and want to um, make a difference and use, use what um, legal measures there are to protect our sites, who truly mm -hmm. are concerned of that, wouldn't, um, you know, acknowledge as, as Professor Roberts would say about the, the, the dominant narrative and how we need to get our counter narratives into um, the public as well. Right, thank you for that. We also learned that when I was with the National Trust with our colleagues on Guam, on Guahan and the, and the fight to try and preserve Paget, the ancient site uh, there that was slated to be a live firing range, a new live firing range site. Uh, for the Marine Corps. Um, I couldn't agree more in terms of the advocacy, the proactive advocational use of whatever tools are there. Uh, sometimes they can be pretty powerful. Yes. In the right hands. <laughs> <laughs> Great, we we'll have um, just a few minutes left. I think I'd like to, to close on a, a question for, for all of the panelists and thinking about issues of equity and justice and um, how they've been issues for in the field of historic preservation for decades. And what what is it about this moment that maybe provides hope for the future? Do you feel that there is, there is change uh, on the horizon? And uh, if you have any thoughts you'd like to share about maybe what our next steps should be in moving forward. I think you're seeing the culture of our combined politeness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Let's start in Hawaii, and then we'll move. Uh, we'll move to the east. <laughs> I'm not sure how to say that. I think um, what is it that we're looking at? So let's just look at the COVID pandemic, for example. Um, and you know, and in, in, in the Chinese proverb is that crisis is both opportunity and danger. And so as, as much as we're facing danger, we've found that there are opportunities to learn how to pivot away from tourism and, mm -hmm. and that we've learned that tourism is, you know, cannot sustain us during times of pandemics, during national, natural disasters, during economic recessions. And we're learning that we have to be more, um, you know, have to find ways to be more sustainable. And we've also found that with, with tourism being reduced so substantially that our, our cultural sites um, are not as impacted as they have been with you know, so, so much tur tourists coming to um, our islands. And so our, our natural resource areas, our cultural resource areas are all coming back and, and thriving without having such heavy impact from tourism. So that's one lesson we've learned. Um, I think moving forward with the, a new administration and um, that we're we're so we're so hopeful that now there is a democratic um, a majority and and that hopefully we can move away from the the hate and the uh, divisiveness that has um, plagued our uh, plagued the United States. Um, although I know in Hawaii it sort of made us more more urgent feel more the urgency to try to uh, regain our sovereignty once again as an independent nation because. Um, you know, our, our future is, is in 
you know, our Pacific direction and we're an island nation. Um, so those are other opportunities we're looking at as well. <laughs> well, and you've done so well as island communities, as we've seen throughout the Pacific in coming together um, to try and actually address the public health crisis before it becomes, a, you know, the magnitude on the mainland too. So, yes, yeah. 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 What about you there in the complicated landscape of Texas? Dr. <laughs> complicated. Again, very, very polite. Uh, so, uh, I, I think that our landscape, um, our specifically our demographics are changing as such that uh, we will have a very different political profile very soon. And that will also bring to light the level of ethnic and racial diversity that is Texas. And in many ways will be a bellwether and a leader for a lot of conversations by virtue of where we are in our population on climate change. And um, I'm hoping to elevate us as not just the frontier narrative of, you know, a manifest destiny, it's open space and we're the West, but rather yeah. the very deep, long history of uh, the relationship between humans and land that right. go, you know, you could go to 1528 and uh, with, uh, Esteban, who, you know, came with an explorer in the 1520s, you know, um, but we will, I think, have an opportunity as we diversify uh, to have to look at um, the history of the state and by virtue of that, the history of the nation in a whole new way. Right, which I think is so powerful, you know, picking up on a couple of things. I love how we're all in our, in very, both personal as well as um, um, uh, pedagogically and philosophically in terms of practice um, rooted in place. Um, and I think it, it, if, I, if I have anything to tell anyone ever, I often ask them just to start with the deepest understanding, right, of the complications right. and, and not to go with- Complications. Not to go with the, 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 what you see, the frosting on the cake. Think like a paleontologist, right? Think- right. You know, right. think all of the layers, at least a geologist, right? Um, <laughs> but I guess what gives, and I think we're all being, you know, kind of cultural geographers as well. But um, what gives me hope actually is this moment. Um, you know, the, the late great John Lewis had a wonderful quote that um, you never know what day you're going to wake up and you will be able to make history. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if history has been taught in the common discourse as much as has been in the past, let's say four or five years, right? History has its eyes on you, it's watching you, it's gonna judge you. It, like, all of a sudden history is this thing, but we know that's not true. We know that it's historians and practitioners and, and elders and um, um, so many people who care about that intersection, right? Between place and memory and empowerment and justice and carrying that forward. So I, if, if awareness is a big part of the, of the challenge and a big part of, of progress, then I think we're on a remarkable place of awareness, not necessarily concurrent. Yes, but and I, yes. Yeah. I also think we need to bring gender very explicitly in this conversation in that uh, modes of communication and the centering of feeling and attachment right. um, need not be pathologized, but exactly. be an explicit strength that everyone brings to our conversations and our advocacy. Uh, right. Nothing to apologize, but to yep. instead foreground. And too often it's been, we don't need any more talk. We don't need any more feeling. We don't need any more sentiment. Right. Let's deal with the real action. And well, uh, misogyny, of course, is, you know, right. something we've been, you know, encountering for. No, I think that's well said. The, um, the ways in which um, leadership even in these yes. times. Right. If we talk differently about leadership, we talk about empathetic leadership. But I think what all of us have been doing in our own careers, um, and that is exemplified just by how you know Don has structured Don. Oh, that's a forward and slip. Michelle, um, we're honored to Don. Um, <laughs> I mean, Don's graciousness um, um, has um, has brought forth is. Um, um, is that understanding of, of empathy. And, um, and, and using that, um, that honor, right? And then that kind of humility that you come to those places um, 
And also I think the, uh, all of us, and I include Luis in this, whom I've known for you know 25 years, we mm -hmm. also don't want to keep on going to the same meetings. And seeing the same people, right? <laughs> as much as I love to see. And having the same conversations, right? right. I mean, yeah. Um, Absolutely. When I was 25 years old, we were having the, you know, teeth mashing. Oh my God, we're not diverse enough. It's like, no, we got to mm. stop doing that. Mm. We mm -hmm. have to do the projects like you're doing, right? We have to do the work that we're doing um, and open up new and remarkable avenues for those who are following with us and those who are coming afterwards, which I think is really exciting too, in terms of that all of you, I teach in a different way now, but that all of us still pride ourselves on trying to be the best educators we can. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think all I'm of sorry, you- Rhonda, we're kind of running away. Okay. <laughs> My job is We're going to go carry on somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And thank you all for this wonderful, the presentation, the discussion. I'm sorry I have to cut you off because I know that we could, we could talk about this quite a bit longer, but I'm hopeful too that uh, given your examples that there is real change happening now and we won't be having these conversations 25 years from now. So thank you all for participating. 